Welcome, folks. CIS critical control number one. Uno. Asset story. <laughs> and you know, it's it's so great that it is the first entry because it is so critical to everything that we do. And what's funny is knowing the SANS organization for such a long time and being involved and partaking in that you know, conversation, they've had a lot of conversation around how they structured their critical controls. And uh, I love their messaging is, yeah, asset management did not accidentally wind up as number one. Yeah. That was done purposefully. <laughs> Well, it's a, you know, it's a particularly difficult area, right? Because, uh, you know, if, if you're not familiar with the concept of shadow IT, actually at a place that uh, Mike and I worked together, there was definitely a variety of shadow IT organizations. And so uh, shadow IT is like an IT function that exists outside of the formal IT function that you're in your company or whoever might have. So um this is, I think, largely a result of IT organizations not being responsive to the needs of the business and saying like, hey, like, uh, you know, if someone requests something and then either that silent or that, uh, that res excuse me, that question is not answered timely or if it's denied, if people need it to do their jobs, like they don't care about IT, they don't care about security, they don't care about assets, they just care about getting their job done. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna gonna do it. In fact, actually, I was working at, uh, maybe at a hospital that Mike and I worked at together, and I was walking through the hallways, and I looked at the ceiling, and I saw a wireless router uh, zip tied to the ceiling, and I was like, "Oh, that's a Linksys. Like that uh, that doesn't belong there." And so we kicked off an incident, and we were having it investigated. And right before I had it ripped off the ceiling, I get a call from one of the clinicians, uh, and they were like, hey, you can't take that down. And I was like, what do you mean I can't take that down? And they said, there are 12 hearts hooked up to that. And I'm like, e excuse me? <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> there are 12 hearts hooked up to this thing? And I guess they're doing some sort of clinical research study. Um, and they were using that wireless router to, you know, connect to the base stations or whatever that these pacemakers were connected to, to gather clinical data. And they had set that up because when they went to the help desk to ask for help in setting up a wireless router, they were told no. And from the clinician's point of view, they were like, well, I need to do this. And so if you're going to tell me no, I'm going to figure out a way, right? I'm a doctor. I know everything. Uh, so that's what's up. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that would be a good example, I think, of, of shadow IT, because that's not going to show up in an asset database somewhere. You know, that's not, not something you've procured normally. And, and here's the thing. I, you know, I'm a security person. I have lived as a security person for you know, 15, 20 years at the point, you know, that we are now. Um, and even I have violated those standards and deployed things because I needed them to get just done. I needed either a feature, I needed a you know bastion, I needed something, and I just couldn't get it. Like, hey, no one would give me compute, no one would let me run this script, no one would give me admin on my box, which I shouldn't have, but I kind of want it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will say, like on the other side of things, as a developer, I need to be able to debug my applications, and I can't uh, attach a debugger unless I have admin rights, right? And um, you know, the the debug right. Uh, for Windows security entitlements is pretty nasty. And so knowing not only the devices that you have, but also the the roles of people who are on those machines and what they can do, I think is incredibly important. Absolutely. And I think that there is, I think there is an element to asset control that is point in time, but then also ongoing. So there's mm -hmm. like the provisioning and deprovisioning life cycle, which I can talk about in a second. Um, but, but then making sure that you stay on top of it on a regular basis where, and this gets into the, the IR approach, so incident response where, uh, you know, I, I worked with a client who experienced an APT level event. Um, they brought us in and said, Mike, turns out we don't have MFA on any of our VPNs. I need you to go out and install it on our three VPN termination endpoints. And, you know, they had... I think three globally is what their CISO told me. Now, to do IR responsibly, one of those first things you're going to do is uh, identify everything in the environment, right? So we'll do 
external enumeration and identify assets externally. We'll do it internally as well. Um, and so in that process, you know, within a few minutes, we went out and we looked on Shodan and we looked for AS peering and what's in these networks. Uh, and I came back to that CISO within, you know, an hour and I gave him a list of 16 VPN endpoints that I found in his environment globally. And I said, okay, uh, Mr. CISO, which three do you know about? And I think that's the, that's the point where I really saw his soul leave his body because he thought he had this incident under control until he realized just how much out there in his environment he didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, in SEC 504, we talk about an incident response model called DARE, which is the dynamic approach to incident response. And this is actually a really great example of that because um, one of the big things that we focus on is talking about scoping. And it's like, you know, in this case, right, the CISO thought that there was three assets. And then once you did a little bit of, you know, containment, essentially, you realize like, oh, actually, there is a lot more than this. And so you have to sort of go back to that scoping question of who's using what, what can we shut off? Like, what controls do we have for these things? Um, and just a little like, low level pro tip, one of the most useful data sources for finding inappropriate things leaked in your environment is certificate transparency logs. So if you are not familiar, um, there is a, a log, it's a certificate transparency log. And essentially for most certificate providers, if you request a certificate, it'll get appended onto one of these logs. And there's a variety of uh, services you can use to monitor what's on the certificate transparency log. Census is what I use. Um, they're pretty good. There's also Cert uh, SH, which is good. There's a Google search um, that's being going to be deprecated because Google kills everything, but it is available. Um, but Only you can actually get access. Useful. What? Only if it's useful. That's fair. That's true. Like RIP Google Reader, which I actually do deeply miss. Yeah. Um, and you can also parse these logs yourself. Um, as long as you're not looking to store them, it's actually not particularly hard to do this. So monitoring uh, just the certs that people are requesting can be hugely beneficial for doing external like asset validation. Yep. Absolutely. No, I, I love that. And I, it must have been, I want to say eight years ago, when we worked at a hospital together. And I think you were actually the one who introduced me to CT logs, where you're like, hey, if you're looking for something, did you check your certificate transparency logs? And I said, Kevin, I don't know what certificate transparency logs are. And then you you opened me up to a whole new world and it was fantastic. And yeah, I've no, that they, every day since. <laughs> they're just a, a tremendous, like relatively low value or actually low cost, a high value data source. Um, one of the things that I actually think they're pretty useful for as well is looking for phishing attacks. Um, this is a bit outside of the scope of the, the control we're talking about, but um, you know, for a long time we told our relatives and, and coworkers to look for the lock right in the address bar, and then Let's Encrypt came along, and you can get free certificates. And regardless of what you think of their uh, philosophical position on this, um, it is just a reality that we have to deal with that adversaries or bad actors or whatever you want to call them are able to get valid SSL certificates or TLS certificates, uh, whatever your preferred nomenclature is. And, uh, but, but that is actually sort of beneficial to, to blue teams and defenders because we can look at those logs. Anyone can look at those logs and say, Hey, um, yeah, like I, I someone stood up, you know, Kevin dot VPN dot totally not suspicious dot grandma's cookies dot UK. Right, like that's that's weird. I mean, let's be real. Really dot tk. It'd be dot tk for sure, or dot xyz. Or but, XYZ um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, we can talk about that as like a separate episode. But uh, certificate transparency logs are tremendously useful for yeah. asset enumeration. Well, I actually think that that is a good way to just uh, you know put an almost little asterisk in and say there's going to be heavy overlap between these segments because your security controls are an ecosystem. They do not live on their own. They interplay, you know, controls can, uh, you know, mitigate some things, can augment others. So there will be overlap. And I think it's a great point to bring up. Yeah. And with that, you know, something that I'll, I'll sort of shout out to my software development peeps is uh, the way that I approach these things is in a manner called loose coupling, which I know is sort of a funny um, like way to describe that. But 
let's think about these controls and the topics that we talk about. And let's think about inputs, um, sort of the processing step, and then the outputs, and how the inputs and outputs can be almost agnostic to what's actually happening in our algorithms or these you know, opaque boxes that we're developing to handle these problems. And think about how we can connect like the data that comes into an asset management service from a hardware point of view can also enable the data that goes into a software asset management service. So absolutely. And that'll yeah. be coming up soon. Indeed. A little uh, foreshadowing, I believe it's yeah. called. It's, it's a wonderful tool. <laughs> it is. No, but along those lines, you know, this can be seen from a variety of different approaches. From an architecture perspective, I need to know what controls I need to put in based on the types of assets that I have. And the, it's not just, it's not just, is it Windows? Is it Linux? Is it Mac? It's, do I own it and do I manage it? And all the permutations of that. So do I maybe own it, but don't manage it where, Hey, maybe I've purchased a solution. How do I build controls around that? Do I not own it and not manage it? You know, maybe a guest, uh, or maybe I don't own it, but I do manage it maybe in like a BOD, you know, BYOD type of world. Um, and all those will have different controls that you can apply to them. And so it's incredibly important to understand what's on your network, what you're responsible for, and the controls that you can apply to those types of technologies. Um, one other thing I wanted to, to bring up with regard to asset management, especially as your organization maybe matures. Um, so like I've had, I've had customers that are great where when something is provisioned, they have good provisioning, they have accounting, they have tracking, um, but what they don't maybe necessarily do is do deprovisioning well or mm -hmm. track it throughout their life cycle or the only way that they're identifying their assets is by what's in that database. They're not going and using third-party services. They're not looking in cloud solutions. Um, we actually had a, a healthcare, well, I guess it was a university that ran a medical school. And in that medical school, that, that's what they had. They were fantastic. They're a, they're a massive organization. They tracked every single asset down to the penny. Um, and they had a server that all of a sudden popped up on an Nmap scan because we run Nmap scans on the regular just to see, hey, what's in your range? If something pops up and it's new, I should be able to go back to the security team and they have a ticket or something to tell me why that thing now exists. Um, and as soon as I saw it pop, you know, we did a quick end map and we're like, Ooh, this is a Tomcat server and it's an old Tomcat server. Uh, and so I reached out to their CISO and I said, Hey, you know, we saw this thing pop last night. Any idea what this is? And he goes, I know exactly what that is. And that should not be online. And so what had happened is in their deprovisioning process, they power off VMs and then they leave it for a year to make sure that no one complains. And once it's done with a year, they get rid of it, you know, clear yeah. out the flat files, the VMDKs, all that good stuff. And <laughs> what happened is they experienced a power outage in their data center. And so somebody went back in and said, oh, all these VMs should be powered back on and turned on VMs that hadn't been patched in a year, <laughs> you know, running a really out of date software. Um, and so, you know, these guys, had the provisioning and almost kind of the deprovisioning stuff nailed down, but they weren't doing that iterative checking all the time. They weren't checking CT logs. They weren't looking at external third-party sources. Uh, and then speaking of third-party sources, Kevin, I'm actually going to tap you on this because I've kind of made this joke before knowing how much you love APIs, um, <laughs> you know, to steal something from, uh, <laughs> from John Strand, get your stuff off Shodan. SOS. Yeah. Um, so Kevin, I believe, and this is just my personal opinion. I believe you probably consume more Shodan data than anyone else on the planet. Uh, and it's like me and it? cyber uh, security insurance companies. I okay. think we're the, the, the main two consumers of Shodan data for sure. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I'm a big believer in using those third-party services, you know, your Zoom eyes, your Shodans, uh, to see what is tied to your organization on top of certificate transparency logs to understand, you know, what your developers may be doing or testing or forget that's out there. Uh, and then using that as a way to start, you know, maybe pulling back and, and telling your developers, hey, I understand you got to get your job done. You can't open RDP to the internet. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think using the services like Shodan, ZoomI, Census is actually pretty good. Um, they use an underlying tool called ZMap, I believe, still. Um, there, there is a difference between reconnaissance and scanning. And this is actually something that I've had somewhat of a, a difficulty articulating uh, to management as much as I would like in that reconnaissance is like driving by someone's house and you just sort of like look to see like, all right, they got some windows in the front. They have a gate maybe that leads to their backyard, but you're not going to know if someone's looking at your house when you drive by, right? Whereas scanning is more like tapping on the windows, trying the door handle, right? Like trying to open up your garage door or whatever. That is significantly noisier. Um, and so with, with Shodan, uh, I think getting a sense of like, what is exposed to the internet on something like Shodan or Census or ZoomI lets you know what attackers are probably going to look at first. So it helps you prioritize assets to watch for. Because you have to think that there is sort of the layer three asset, which is the IP, right, at a high level, kind of domain name, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. And there's also services. And so if you have port 443 open to the internet, that's probably fine. Unless it's like an admin page, that would be bad. You need to dig into that. But if you have anything uh, running on your network that has port 22 open, like there needs to be a little soul searching. And sometimes that's totally legit. I've seen... 22 open as like SFTP services, like file transfer services, completely normal, no big deal. It's all good, well managed. Or you're running I've seen SSH exposed, uh, like on management networks out to the internet, and it wow. very much should not have been. <laughs> so, no, fair enough. Yeah, I mean that's that that is something I would like to give as a takeaway to anybody in here who is responsible for maybe having this control in your environment is hop on Shodan, hop on ZoomI. And I do recommend trying both because I have seen instances where ZoomI picks up on something and Shodan doesn't. I actually hadn't used census for asset scanning. I've always done it for certificate transparency logs. Um, so it's interesting to know that they, they do that too. Yeah. Um, but adding those things in and, and just understanding what's in your environment and why. Because I'm sure, like everybody, you change jobs. And when you go in and you say, why do we have remote desktop running internet facing? Like that feels silly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so helping to understand your environment. It's also, if you're responsible for the technology, understanding your environment, it's great for that because you'll probably find something that you don't even know that's there. Yeah. And then, you know, hey, I have these services. We have these developers, et cetera. I think the the subtlety there that's good for people to keep in mind is that um, something that I see really commonly is marketing sites that are stood up that are really poorly configured and it might lead to information disclosure or like some sort of pivot into an environment. And it's really easy for us as InfoSec people to stand here or sit here, you know, on our cameras and be like, these silly marketers, these silly business people, whatever. But when you're thinking about this from the perspective of business, and there's a VP of marketing who says, hey, my organization makes this company $200 million a year, who then looks at the CISO and says, your organization cost us $20 million a year. And the CEO has to make a decision on who's going to win a particular argument about like asset provisioning or standing up things. It's probably not going to be the InfoSec people, right? Like very rarely is InfoSec... Uh, like a cost driver, like we saved money, but some of that's like sort of intangible and hard to calculate. So, you know, I would say, I always try to approach these situations with a degree of, of empathy and mercy, I guess you would say, Absolutely. before I start like really casting stones, but it's good for us to know, like if, if you're an InfoSec person and you know that it is really difficult to get servers provisioned in your environment, you have to be aware that like marketing sites are going to pop up on AWS yeah. and those AWS accounts might have like buckets that they're tied to that have static assets and who knows what else is in those buckets. Right. Absolutely. So yeah. I, again, I think about it more from like, Oh, I've had to build like websites before under duress um, <laughs> and, and security, you know, wasn't my first thought. It was yeah. like, Hey, I need to get this launched. It's two in the morning. I want to go to bed. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do something nasty here. <laughs> Uh, but good thing it only lives forever. That's true. Yeah. 
yeah, the old DC 480 site was definitely uh, set up with not a, not as much concern for. I mean, it was a static S3 site, so there's nothing too wild on it. But yeah. uh, it was a little bit more of like, hey, I need to get this running because it's it's uh, December and we have meetings starting in January. So. <laughs> So along those lines, everyone should know Shodan's free. Register for an account. Census there is free. so Shodan, you do. It's worth paying the fifty or whatever dollars yeah. it is for the the upgraded license, though. Hundred um, percent because you access to filters. Um, I personally uh, have access to the Enterprise API. It is tremendous. Um, it has saved the company I work for currently like millions upon millions of dollars. Um, and if you have questions, you know, ping us on Twitter and we'll be happy to, to kind of help you noodle through some ideas. Obviously, everything we provide is a suggestion, no warranty implied kind of things, but um, we've seen a lot of things. So we're happy to talk about them. Maybe yeah. even we'll integrate a Q&A once we start getting cues to A. We'll see. Maybe. <laughs> um, but yeah, so everything we mentioned here, at least from an external face, all free. Um, I do want to pivot a tiny bit to maybe internal, which may not be as big of a deal in the current environment, right? With everyone working remotely, maybe you can't actually scan or enumerate. But one thing I wanted to make people aware is if you do have an on-prem or a campus or a location presence, um, take a look at rumble.run. So for anyone not familiar, uh, HD Moore, the creator of Metasploit, uh, he, you know, after he uh, sold his company off to Rapid7 and, and, you know, did what he wanted to do, uh, went and started up uh, rumble.run, and it is an asset inventory scanning management type platform uh, for up to a thousand assets. It's free. I highly recommend uh, running it in your environment. You basically put a scanner in, it uploads data to the cloud. It's fantastic for visualization. Um, and one, I think that they're really good at determining assets in roundabout ways. But one thing I really, really love about that platform above any other asset one that I've worked with is they don't require credentials. So, you mm. know, in many environments where I've worked, the asset management tool is spraying privileged credentials all over the place to go and determine what an asset is. You know, it's Windows credentials, it's SSH keys, um, or, you know, privilege. I mean, not that anyone ever would ever set up root to log in, but it's happened. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but being able to capture those credentials and Rumble doesn't do that. Um, they do some amazingly creative things to determine what the endpoint is. Um, and even sometimes the features or software that may be present on those endpoints. Yeah. And if you're, uh, you know, a dev like me and you kind of want to think about how you might be able to implement something like this, ARP tables are, are tremendously helpful to figure out what your machines are communicating with. CAM tables, which are very similar to ARP tables on switches, uh, are very helpful to look at. Uh, you can also do pinging out to broadcast addresses, uh, addresses which would be you know 255 or let's say you have 192.168.0.0, right? Try to ping 192.168.255.255 and see what you get back, depending on what your subnet mask is. If you have IPv6 assets, which is actually a pretty interesting area to look at, you can do a ping to FF02 colon colon one. And that'll tell you other uh, IPv6 things that might exist on your network. So there are ways to, to implement this at a really low level if you want to get uh, pretty gangster with it, which I do. Um, <laughs> but but Rumble is uh, is tremendous, right? Um, there's also like for commercial solutions, you have things like Infoblox, um, which I know a few people who I've talked to generally like what they're able to do. Um, in some of the like the terms you might hear in this space are like IPAM, which is IP asset management. Uh, is there other ones that you're aware of? Like enterprise asset management is another um, one which I've kind of heard, but. Well, so, so it would be IPAM. I think you start getting into a weird spot where the function of IPAM gets performed by other solutions. Um, in that I've seen some InfoSec programs use a vulnerability management solution as their IPAM, where, you know, they scan on a regular basis, <laughs> or as soon as something joins the network, they go and scan. Um, but, yeah. you know, everything about that endpoint is stored in, you know, a Rapid7, a Qualys, or Nessus, you know, whatever they have. Um, but it's not really meant to be that. It just kind yeah. of fits that role by nature of how it works. Um, so along those lines, you know, there are other solutions out there. Um, you know, I was kind of thinking along the lines of 
you know, what could we do that would give people, you know, low cost of entry, especially in the SMB space. Um, but yeah, I love info blocks. Um, <laughs> yeah. Great solution. I think there's blue cat would be another one uh, mm -hmm. in that space. And so, uh, you know, if you've got the ability to, you know, if you've got budget to go and get it, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And like a, a side note is if you're relying on your vulnerability scanning, vulnerability management, uh, like tools and appliances to do that for you, make sure you understand the space that you're operating in. Um, because if you have like a medical device that has, uh, let's say an older kernel or a stripped down kernel that doesn't implement all the features of a modern TCP IP stack, it is very possible that you're going to plug in a expensive medical device onto your network and your vulnerability scanner is going to instantly knock it offline because it's going to fill up its TCP connection table with half open connections and then the, the thing will crash or, or no longer respond. Uh, not that I've ever seen that happen before, but yeah, just, just something to be aware of. Yeah, that felt, that felt not made up. <laughs> yeah. Or perhaps if you're working for a grocery store and you have a deli meats uh, slicer that does, uh, you know, like reports um, inventory updates and it's very old and it's on the Linux 2.4 kernel and has a lot of really weird things about it, right? Just just be mindful that if you're relying on your, your vulnerability management ser server or service or whatever to find new assets, it can, it can cause you some heartache. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And that's, that is a control coming up. I think that's control seven. All right. And man, I've got some great stories around how uh Vaughn management went sideways on me. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm in. All right. Well, very cool. So I think that's all I really had around asset management, why it's important, where I've seen it be useful, both for architecture, integration, operationalization. You know, you've had some fantastic feedback around, you know, Hey, if you needed to do it yourself or wanted to do it yourself, uh, I, I am very much the buy it as opposed to build it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's great to hear somebody say, no, I want to build it. That sounds cool. Yeah. I, I would say like, if you're interested and I've written some software around this, um, look at SNMP, which is simple network management protocol. Um, I had to do a solution for a PCI environment once where we had to monitor the cam tables or content addressable memory. It's just, again, as I mentioned, similar to ARP okay. to see if something gets plugged into the network. Um, cause they need to know like, Hey, is someone plugging into our PCI network and, uh, using SNMP MIBs or management information blocks, I believe is what they're called. Uh, you can see like what gets plugged in. And if you, you know, hit all of your SNMP, uh, like cam table MIBs every five minutes, you know, you can see people plugging stuff in and, and maybe removing stuff from your network. So there's, there's a lot of stuff there. Well, heck yeah. All right. Well, then uh, I think we can shut this session down for this week, pick it up again uh, next week or maybe in two weeks uh, we'll, where we'll be taking on software asset inventory. Oh, that's my jam. Remember, KT at War on Shrugs on Twitter, if you want to hit me up. Um, Deganis on GitHub, if you want to see some of the tools that I've written. Mike, where can people get a hold of you? Uh, I'm Mike Bonner. Uh, I guess I run Bonner Security, available on LinkedIn, keeping it nice and simple and professional, uh, mostly because I'm a really bad developer and no one should ever see my code. Uh, normally, I try to be very conciliatory in these discussions, but that is uh, absolute, absolutely and categorically true. So yeah, until yeah, next I, week or two weeks. Yeah, we'll make it happen. Take it easy. Take it easy, guys. Bye. Bye.